presentations on housing, clothing, <coughs> cooking, and song dynasty, as Tara and Caesar already mentioned, um, housing used to be, like, this was a very important part of the culture. So, so housing, um, as Tara and Caesar mentioned, the houses were very compact for the commoner people. They were often made of materials such as bamboo, wood, bricks, and tiles, making them, they were light, but durable, and they were flexible. Like, oftentimes, like, entire buildings could move, actually, quite regularly. Stones were reserved for things like roads or Buddhist temples, things that were meant to last. Um, I remember when we went to a Buddhist temple in Taiwan, in Taipei, um, like, most of the material, I mean, the city itself was modernized, but, like, the temple was typically just made of stone, and just, like, you could just see the artwork that had gone into it. Um, they, stone was also never used, like, even those, like, extremely wealthy people, like, like, merchants or such, they, they, they would have their, the material that would be made for their housing, it's the same as the commoners. Um, generally, sorry, generally the most expensive part of the building was uh, the roof, and it was generally just extremely consistent, it was always the same thing for every building. It had two slopes that rested on main beams and cross beams, often sometimes having color, like, painted on top of the roof, and the most wealthiest fam like the most wealthiest homes and imperial buildings had curved roofs, curved roofs with it, which were enforced by imperial decree. decree. Um, if you were really wealthy, you would have like uh, like gargoyles and like pink designs on like if, on uh, decorating your decorating the outside. Uh, that was partly for decoration, but it was also to uh, it was also as a, as a sort of gar uh, sort of guarding these these instances. Uh, a lot of them were in the shapes of dragons and phoenixes. They were uh, commoners weren't allowed to use them for their houses. Um, <coughs> and the same thing with gates, which only, which commoners weren't allowed to use. Uh, it was mostly uh, the imperial family and government buildings that were allowed to use them. And they would have gates with several passageways, and they would have a screen in front to keep entrance out of bad spirits. The gates would have, uh, like, gate gods, which were often, like, some historical person who, who died and was elevated to godhood, like captains of the guard that had served loyally to kind of keep out evil spirits even, uh, even after they died. Um, principles of feng shui were used a lot in the in the construction of buildings and in the layout. For example, uh, whenever possible, and a door was supposed to be on the south side of the building. And that actually has a practical use too. Uh, and the pra because cold winds often came from the north. So if you have your door on the south, then the wind doesn't blow right into your house. So um, often, like, Tara and Caesar mentioned there were restaurants and shops. They were usually built on the ground floor. And in Taiwan, if I, they had, because it's such a big part of their economy, I like people would usually have a restaurant and then live above the, the house, and they would rarely, they would, I rarely saw a second floor restaurant or a shop. So um, interior, decor interior decoration is often more actually considered more important than the outside. Like the outside, they, they didn't really care much how the house looked. What they really cared about was interior, the interior. So um, chairs actually were, weren't very common. They were called, um, there's this type of chair called um, the barbarian seat, which had like, which, which is like a light movable chair, but had its legs crossed in the X shape. And um, um, chairs had been adopted from uh, India through move that had been imported through Central Asia. Um, the furniture was often simple and unobtrusive. It was, um, it, it was elegant, yes, but it was never really like, say, gaudy or whatnot. The, uh, the dominant colors for interior decorating, uh, by far, like, almost everything had at least some element. It was either black or it was red. And if you were really wealthy, your furniture would be, would usually be made of, of lacquer, usually black lacquer, uh, especially your bed. And only the emperor could have a bed with red, that was red lacquer. That was another thing that was enforced by imperial decree. Uh, the, 
the decorations included stuff like calligraphy that was hung on the walls, uh, antique vases, uh, small a terracotta animals, and figurines. Yeah. Only the really fancy calligraphy would be hung on the walls, so mine would never be found on the wall. <laughs> um, flower arrangement became really popular in this time. Mostly you hear about it from Japan. That it was like people would have their flowers imported from all over the world just to be used because um, they'd be used as like um, protection and like as a way to brighten up the brighten up the atmosphere. And another thing was um, smells, like scents, like because it used to be it used to smell pretty bad. So perfumes and incense would be often used to make the house smell good. But there's this thing, this thing called mosquito scopes, mosquito smoke. Huh? Mosquito smoke that was sold on the streets. But it was it was used as a fumigating powder because typically in the afternoon when the mosquitoes were at their strongest. Um, so, um, like the poor the poor were out obviously packing into large multi-story complexes. The how fires were a really big fire like hazard leading to a large homeless population. But um, there were like things that would help alleviate for the poor, like people could live in monasteries, large boats, people, like um, fishermen often lived on boats, like, they, like their families lived on the boats with them, so they didn't really have to worry about housing, and they, I guess they didn't really have to worry about fire hazards because they were on the river, and so military bar 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 barracks, <laughs> military barracks and, um, could be used, and so could temporary sh uh, shelters of waterproof matting that could protect them from the rain and the weather, um, and so, yeah. Um, one, thing, one thing that surprised me was the frequency of bath bathing in the region is more common in the south, um, in Hangzhou rather than the north, where it's probably where it's cold and bathing would, would be a dangerous habit to do so. So um, it was actually interesting that, well, interestingly enough, only the really wealthy had bath, like the, could be able to construct bathtubs in their own house. So um, this is where the term bath, this is where bath, ho bath houses come into use because on well, only the poor really used them. And, but they became like, became like a social gathering area. There's entertainment. You could like you could have services provided there. Obviously, prostitution was an issue, but it always is. So, and another thing was the funny thing is that the bathhouses had both hot and cold water. But like the hot water was only reserved for foreigners, for like um, Muslims who, were, who who came to visit uh, the capital. Um, so one of the one of the interesting facts is facts is that all the buildings were rectangular in shape. But, um, um, typically, the poor only had say one building, but like estates of the wealthy were made of, like several, like multi like complexes that had like several buildings that were connected together by gates, and they were usually shaped in e wing, a U shape, or like in right angles. And uh, I only discovered this actually after I had submitted it, so I couldn't really add it to the PowerPoint. But yeah, there are some pretty interesting. Uh, these are paintings, not actual, like, actual Chinese, uh, like, actual pictures or anything of Chinese architecture, but, uh, they're pretty accurate, like, this is, like, a ma like, a monastery on a mountain, or, like, a temple, uh, mountain temple, that, di that dates from, like, the, the painting dates from about the mid-10th century. When we were in Taiwan, actually, I saw a building pretty similar to that. It was the Buddhist temple and also the Chiang Kai Kai-shek Memorial in Taipei. So, like the style of building is pretty, still pretty similar. So it's like really interesting how like how it transferred from Taiwan from China to Taiwan and still remains very relevant today. is about clothing. Um, clothing often had two uses. It was um, to protect yourself from weather, obviously, and it was the use of like sign of social status, like the most like ornate clothing or like fancy clothing was used reserved for the emperor, obviously. And so um, one way they protect what because it was very cold, they used to, they protected themselves, but they kept warm by having like the, like the inside lined with floss soap to trap heat and warm with like also fur lined, which is you know pretty common, obviously. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, um, 
the color and the ornamentation of your clothes, what type of headgear you wore, sometimes even how you wore things, what kind of accessories you could wear, those all were indications of your social status that pretty much everyone was expected to know and acknowledge, and it, this was all enforced by imperial decree. This was all like official. Like They actually spent a lot of time and effort on uh, codifying uh, exactly what someone of a certain social class could wear. In the Sui dynasty, colors were used to differentiate different ranks in the government. Uh, those above a certain degree of rank, you have to wear a green robe. If you're above a, a, at a certain rank above that, you have to wear a purple robe. And oh wait, not, I have that mixed up. At a certain rank, you wear purple, and then after that, you wear green. But and you know, black and white—that's what ordinary people wear. But over time, that kind of started to break down to the point that just every official could wear a purple robe if he wanted. Because that, that's uh, something that kind of, that is kind of a pattern there, is that they make these very restrictive things about clothing, but over time that kind of breaks down and people are, and the restrictions get more loose. Uh, for, a, for another example, there were these round uh, um, parasols, which are like umbrellas of... Men protected from the sun, you see them a lot with um, aided women trying to protect their skin from the sun. Uh, with these blue, made of blue-green silk. They, at first, you could only use one of those if you were a prince of the royal family. But then they started uh, giving it, giving the right to use that as a reward to certain officials. But and then they relaxed that even more so that you know, imper uh, women of the imperial of the imperial palace who went out in town, she said, uh, women would use that to protect their skin. And then the. <coughs> And basically, there were attempts to uh, reverse these kinds of trends, but they never really worked. You know, pe uh, just too many people uh, were breaking them; they couldn't really punish everyone. So, it so they've ended up just removing a lot of these restrictions entirely. So, apart from clothing, uh, there all, there's another style that uh, of a clothing that people wore to uh, different social status. Wealthy men wore long robes that often went uh, down to the ground, whereas the poor were, wore like a blouse, like a, like a slightly long shirt um, that could uh, put, that went past the waist and had like colored trousers. Mm -hmm. I think we have an example from the uh, picture. Yeah, so we, do, uh, we do actually. So, um, uh, you see here uh, on the right, you see like these kids playing in a garden. You see that one of them is wearing like robe that goes all the way down, the other one is wearing uh, pants. Because like that's that's like uh, that's like the ch the child of like some someone wealthy and uh, their oh, like, and like, like a, a servant, the child of a servant, servant yeah, who's like the, who's their playmate. But they had up to often like you could you could tell the difference between a wealthy person and a poor person just by the style of clothes they're wearing. Like um, oh, and uh, does anyone want to guess why only like working class people or soldiers? usually would wear pants, and if you're wealthy, you wear a, a robe that goes all the way down to the ground, almost? Yes. I would probably guess because military, uh, A, riding horses, mm -hmm. it's difficult to ride a horse when you're not wearing pants. Um, also, <coughs> if you were working and doing stuff, you would need pants, but if you were wealthy enough to wear a long robe that would normally get in the way, it showed that you could just sit and relax all day. <laughs> Exactly, and um, actually, uh, pants were something borrowed from the northern nomadic tribes, uh, and they get and because, like you said, it's very hard to uh, ride around on a horse while you're wearing a while you're wearing a long robe. So that's why the bar the northern barbarians got in the habit of wearing pants first, and later they borrowed that. So obviously, pants would be seen as more a barbaric thing. And where um, it's the same thing as like foot binding, why people like why people try to remain like white, like lily white instead of tan, because they believe that um, if you were if like for foot binding, it's uh, the trend slowly started dying out. It was only reserved for the wealthy people who, whose women didn't have, who, who weren't required to move around. Well, for the poor people, if you bind a, a girl's foot, it meant that you're like limiting um, you're you're limiting her the use that she could be used 
as a worker in the field or a factory. And so, um, alongside the clothing, women, women wore obviously long dresses or blouses, blouses that could be as long as kneeling, and jackets with uh, long or short sleeves and skirts. And so, typically, a men with a rank had robes that had symbolic designs embroidered on them, such as dragons, phoenixes, phoenixes, and birds. Those um, were um, the dragon and the phoenix are a part of the Chinese mythology, so they they are obviously very important to the culture. And sleeves were often wide, so this is why you see those like big floppy sleeves sometimes. And so they they were often used like uh, used to hide like small items within the sleeves. Yeah, like it like uh, you could actually kind of use them to just like take something right up in your sleeve, save it for later, keep your arms up a bit. Yeah. And there's actually uh, this example in the book of so, of this old man who kept, who. Uh, at, who has his yet? Who has his younger concubine, and he's uh, and he often uh, sne like sneaks treats in his sleeves for her to for her uh, to bring back home later. And this one day he meets an acquaintance on the street, and like he he kind of ba he kind of uh, greets him like bows to him, and the, and uh, the treats like fall right out of his sleeve, and and basically everyone laughs at it. Another indicator of status other than clothing and style clothes you wore was the material that was made out of them. Um, ordinate, like people, like the emperor would be wearing clothes that are made of silk or actually gold bro brocade, like gold thread. And then ordinary people wore cl clothing of hemp cloth. But the thing was cotton, what, cotton was being cultivated during the time period, but it was still considered a very a luxury item. And so like <coughs> people would often have to, have to wear like multi multiple layers just to keep worn so in order not to freeze to death. If it got really really during like really harsh winters. Yeah. Uh, that one in the center that there actually is uh, Emperor Hui Zong, I think. Uh, Song. Uh, you can see he's got he's got he's wearing all red, which is you know I, what I mentioned. It's kind of it's kind of uh, an imperial color at the, in the Song Dynasty here. And notice the uh, headgear he's wearing here. Uh, it's it's got that bar in the back that just goes all the way out. Um, headgear in in Song China is basically everyone wears some something on their head. It except doesn't matter monks. how. Yeah. Except for Buddhist monks who head are shaped bald. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone except a Buddhist monk wears something on their head, even if it's just like a little cap or something. Uh, and also, everyone wears something on their uh, where has foot has footwear. Uh, there are actually a lot of different kinds. There were like leather. There were like leather shoes. There were sandals made of hemp or straw. Uh, <clears throat> really important people would wear like these kinds of these kinds of open-toed boots that laced that were kind of laced up that, that were meant to make them look taller. So we actually have, so people have been doing that for ages. Who knows how long. Yeah, satin slippers are very interesting. I've worn them once as a cultural event when I was younger, when I was in Stone Chinese school. So those those were very interesting. They're kind of hard walking. I don't like it. So, um, yeah. Um, so, also, um, you obviously noticed that the guy, um, the emperor sitting in a chair, chairs were often only used for, like, in government positions or for people who were super important. Not like your normal tax collector, like the emperor. And so, um, do you go back? Sorry. Okay, so they have, they have these things, like, called girdles, which I consider belting. Belting, and they were made of like s like really ornate stuff. Like one of like 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 a common one is rhin rhinoceros horn. So I'm just like I'm wondering where they got a rhinoceros horn in China. I mean, there's obviously the rhinoceros, but that's yeah. I'm just like where did, where did they get the rhinoceros horn from? So they're often worn with blouses and robes. The most expensive had pieces made with go jade, gold, or rhinoceros horn, and attached to these girdles were. Um, small purses which often held money and or other small articles like bubbles, like handkerchiefs, keys, knives, etc. And so uh, also attached with the girdles were fans and there are two kinds of fans. There's the traditional Chinese one which was round and stiff and made out of white silk and the one you typically see like sold, sold as like a Chinese sort of thing. It was actually adopted from Korea. It was, um, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was the folding fan. Fans so the like, like the ones that you see in popular culture, those were actually Korean instead of Chinese. And so, usually, typically, ornamentation, like, all this, like, was usually just reserved for the lu for luxury items. They were for the wealthy, and most common people would never have dreamed of holding 
coin and girdles made of gold, etc. They would have sold those instead. And so, so um, we go next is cooking. And so uh, the recipes actually they're pretty like the, from the ones you can actually read and understand. They seem really really similar to the ones of today, except that they're actually were actually more there's more variation back then. But the recipes often varied varied between regions, basically from north and south, because because of the different different ingredients of it available. And so, um, for class status, the number of dishes actually, like, obviously, the more the more dishes you have, instead of the amount, like, say, you have like a ton of beef, no one really cares about how much beef you have. It's the amount, like, how the beef was used into in, in the number of dishes. And so, so it's like different kinds of ingredients was also very important. And to the poor, typically pork, fish, and rice. Which, um, when I was uh, living, when I was staying with my grandpa and Gosh, and my grand uncle in Gosh, um what we ate mostly was just vegetables and fish and rice. It was great for five days. <laughs> Very little variation. And the thing, what the interesting thing was, not really necessarily interesting, makes more sense now that I look about it, look back to it, is that dairy products were rarely consumed, so like ice cream, cheese, milk, all gone, not there. It's, um, yeah, it would, it, which is probably why most Asian people have issues with dairy now, so, because their, their diets are just used to it. And so, um, actually, the number of dishes expanded greatly during the Song Dynasty, as well as new styles, which, um, such as an increased reliance on rice as the main staple of, of the dish, which makes, which, I'm thinking about it, it makes a lot, lot more sense about, like, how it just shifted completely. Rice is great. I love rice. I wish the cat used it more instead of just trying to fry it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, the first recipe book was actually published during this time period. It was called Madame Wu's Recipe Book, but the in cooking directions weren't very extensive. They were actually pretty simple. Like you know, you stir this one, you put it in the pot, you put it in the oven, and wait like 20 minutes till it's done. <laughs> so um, everyone, um, tea was actually a tea. What I learned from the book was that tea was made from pouring hot water on powder, which now I don't think it happened. Like when I think about how my mom make, makes her tea, um, it makes a lot more sense. But like the tea bags was the tea bag. The tea bags thing is from Britain, so no Britain. And so um, the th funny thing is that the art, of, like during this time period, the art of making tea was perfected and actually made to competitions. Like you, like there would be competitions on how well you pour the tea, pour the hot water onto the tea powder, whether or not it stained the glass, whether or not it stained the teapot, how it tasted, and things like that. And so imported foods made 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 its first appearance during this dynasty. For example, raisins. Um, they had. Like the raisins, you can, like made its way into cooking. They had low used for grapes because they drank rice, rice wine, so like grape wine. So that's different. And um, they also had dates from um, North Africa. And the stereotypes. I, I'd like to adjust the stereotypes things because um, the book. The book actually mentions cannibalism. <laughs> so when they were like when they were extremely desperate during like cold situations, they would eat the remains of human bodies and they'd be called like a two like a um, two-legged animal, so, yeah, and so. But to be okay. fair, like, pretty much all over the world you have people doing that when they get desperate enough. So. Yeah, and so actually, dog wasn't eaten as much as believed. It's it's comparable to snails in France. Like, when you, when, like, when people eat snails in France, it's, that's about how, how much they ate dog in China. So, I'd like to adjust those stereotypes. And um, here are our sources we... That's it.